representation of Brooks Street Library and the Voter Information Committee. And um, of Chris Joyce is right here. She's the chair of the Voter Information Committee. And I will introduce the rest of the committee after. Um, I want to thank Carol Capol for being our speaker today. She's been our town, town accountant and finance director for the past two years. Carol has a master's in accounting as well as a master's in education in business management. Um, she's a certified public accountant and a certified fraud examiner. She's held a variety of municipal positions in municipal finance and consulting, so she's very well at, you know, experienced in all these areas. And was better, at, like, in spite of all of, her, I mean, all of her certificates and education is great, and we're, <coughs> we're so lucky to have her here. But what makes Carol so wonderful is that she's able to take municipal finance and put it into everyday language that you and I can understand. And um, so that's what we're here today. Carol's going to tell us about the basics of municipal finance. Mm -hmm. don't want to forget, um, we provided the handout for you so you can jot down some questions that you have, but then we'll just get going, and I think you're going to need that little bit of a break anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so municipal finance, it's a cycle. It happens every year. Um, it's the same cycle every year, but we have to understand what the components are. So we, we're going to first talk about funding county. We're going to look at the budget process and how important that process is. It's important for you to be involved with that process because, after all, it results in tax increases, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we can talk about what is a credit rating, when do we issue debt, um, and then finally, how do you prepare financial statements? Um, and what is the role of the finance department? Um, in, um, it's an instrumental role in that process. So, what is fund accounting? Well, it's a lot different than a for-profit business, right? A for-profit business says, how much money did we make? Uh, what was our bottom line? Whereas municipal accounting is concerned more about what kind of services did we offer? Did we meet our goals? Did we meet our objectives? Did we do right by our taxpayers? So those are significant differences in, um, in the two methods of accounting. So, we learn more about um, businesses and um, the differences and the similarities um, between them. But if I'm a waste management company and I have a vehicle, a refuse vehicle, um, I'm using that to generate revenue. Whereas if I'm a town and I'm a DPW department, and let's say we pick up your trash, right? Um, that's not generating any revenue because we're providing service to you. There's significant differences. Um, just like that ladder truck that the fire department is using to save lives. Those are services that we're providing. We're not generating any revenue from that. Um, so we, a business exists to make money. But the bottom line is to make money. If you're a for-profit business, 99% of the chance, you're looking at that bottom line, you want to make money. Um, whereas, you look at the bottom line of a municipal budget, and just because you generated more revenue than you spent, that doesn't mean anything. Did you provide the services that you said you were going to provide? Is that, did you, were you able to meet those goals and objectives? That's really what the bottom line is for municipal governments. And then we have constraints. Um, if I'm a corporation, and I've got a hot selling widget, right? I'm making widgets and I've got a hot selling widget. I'm not bound legally by, by certain expenditures, right? I, but if, if, I'm a, if I'm a municipal government and the voters voted in a budget and those expenditures that they vote in are called appropriations, well, for the most part, you cannot overspend. So it doesn't matter whether 
you have extraordinary Snow. paper costs, okay? So you can't overspend your bottom line budget by law. It's not going to happen. There's, you know, things like snow and ice, well, those are exceptions, but those exceptions are rare. So the beast we call Funda County. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet the gentleman that wrote this book. It's an 1100 page riveting book. He is a guru in governmental accounting. And seriously, I, I, I really am a geek because if you look inside of it, he signed it for you. <laughs> if you don't want to borrow it, you can. Um, probably on those sleepless nights that um, you might find some comfort in it. But you can learn all about governmental accounting and financial statements and, um, and the importance of those financial statements because they're so different. This gentleman defined fund accounting, and his name is Stephen Gauthier. Um, it's a tool for organizing and presenting data about financial resources that highlights the fact that certain resources have been segregated for the purpose of carrying on specific activities or attaining cer certain objectives in accordance with specific regulations, restrictions, or limitations. And for state and local governments, that's fund accounting. Okay, well, what does that mean? Because, you know, it, it, I didn't know what that meant at first, you know, maybe 25 years ago. Let's break it down. So we have an organization that donated $500 to the police department. And they said, police department, this really happened. We want you to go buy a coffee maker. But that's the only thing that you can use with this money. And we want you to continue buying coffee for your department until the $500 is gone. So, the board of can accept that donation? We have to account for it separately. We have to account for it, what we call a special fund. We call it a gift fund. Um, and, it, and, and so for that, there's specific regulations. Are those regulations locally imposed? Yes. There are some regulations that are legally imposed. So, you may have the federal government where the harbor master applies for a federal grant, says, federal government, I'm going to spend it on X, Y, and Z, and that is all. And so they're awarded that grant. They're legally required to keep those funds separate. They're, they, they're re we're required to account for them in what we call a special fund. All right? And we're going to talk about funds. So what is municipal finance? And why is it organized in the way that it is? And why do we call them funds? Well, companies may have either legal or liability-wise, they may have, let's say I have five restaurants, OK? Each restaurant has its own federal ID number. Each restaurant is its own corporation. I have five sets of accounting books, right? Because they're, 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 I may be the owner, but they're all separate corporations. The town or for municipal government, we call those separate corporations funds. So we have specific accounting uh, systems that account for those, what we call funds. Um, again, some of those are established by law. Um, some of those are established by local restrictions. Um, and then, such as that $500 gift that we received. Um, um, and some are, are by the discretion of the town. Let's say the town goes to town meeting and they say, we would like a new fund, town meeting. We would like a fund to account for all of the recreation programs that happen in the town of Harwich. We want to talk about, we want to take in money for pickleball, and we want to spend money on pickleball. So we'd like a separate fund for that. So locally, town meeting can vote to approve that fund. So again, it's more, it's more like separate corporations equals separate funds. 
So there's lots of different types of funds. When we go to town meeting and you vote on the operating budget, that's the general fund you're, you're, you're um, voting on. The general fund is the operating budget for town. We have special revenue funds. Those special revenue funds can be gift funds, they can be federal, state, and local um, grants, um, they can be revolving funds, they can be funds we call receipts reserved for appropriation. There's all sorts of funds that are named by this, <laughs> accounted for this way, and they're established by um, an organization in Connecticut called the GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And we're required to keep our accounting records in accordance with their regulations. Okay? So we also have an enterprise fund. Last year, town meeting voted a new enterprise fund, the sewer enterprise fund. We also have the water <coughs> enterprise fund. Those enterprise funds act like businesses. So the intention of an enterprise fund is it receives no help from the taxpayers. Um, so meaning the revenue that they generate and the expenses that they, the, the, the salaries and wages and other expenses um, um, serve to give them a bottom line number, like a corporation would look for. What is our bottom line? What are our retained earnings? That's what an enterprise fund looks like, or acts like, and um, that's how we account for it. Then we have trust funds. So um, we may have trust funds for um, perpetual funds for cemetery flowers, uh, where someone has said, I want to write a trust. My name is John Smith. And I want to put flowers, people to put flowers on my grave for the rest of my life, or for, for forever, excuse <laughs> me, <laughs> forever. Um, and they want them to do it on May 31st of every year. And I can designate it that all out. It's a document, it's a legal document. I turn over my $7,000 to the town of Harwich, and the town of Harwich cannot spend that $7,000. What they can do, because I've told them they can't, what they can do is they can spend the interest on it. So those are called trust funds. Um, and then there's agency funds. Agency funds are funds that don't belong to the town. The town's holding on to them for somebody else, but they don't belong to us. Um, so a good example of that, the best example that um, I can explain, and I know that the school department is separate now from the town of Harwich, but student activity funds. Student activity funds are agency funds. And what are they? The class of 2020. So the class of 2020, all of the students put in $100 to go on a class trip. Well, that money doesn't belong to a school department. It doesn't belong to a town. But they keep the accounting for it. So we do, I know you can't see this, they, they are, the numbers are supposed to add up. <laughs> so what's the general fund? It's the chief operating fund of the town. It contains um, funds that um, are uncommitted or resources that are uncommitted. So what this means is they are not regulated by the federal government, the state government, things of that nature. What does that include? That includes all of your departments. That includes um, DPW, Public Works, all your public safety, fire and police. It includes the town planner or the town administrator and the finance department. It includes all the departments of the town. So then, uh, just to get into a little more about special revenue funds, there's all different types of special revenue funds as, um, as uh, authorized by the state. Um, special revenue funds are always authorized by the state of Massachusetts. Um, there, um, there may be some legal um, restrictions on them, like I talked about, FEMA provides a grant or, or someone provides a grant at the federal level and they say, you will account for it in this way. The state can do that as well. Um, you, you can also get local grants. You may have a business in your community that says, you know what, I want you to bring your technology up to different standards. So I'm going to give you $100,000 and um, Boris Luck accepts it. 
and it's accounted for separately. Uh, but is it legal to legally accounted for separately? Is there a law that tells you you can't spend it on anything else but whatever whatever they want? No, not if it's not a trust fund. Right. Um, we have funds that are called receipts, reserve, or appropriation. Um, so if you think about that, think about those words that are that are that, that name those funds. Those funds are authorized by the state of Massachusetts. Um, so what happens? Those go to town meeting. You want to, if the receipts reserved for appropriation requires an annual appropriation in town meeting. So we have um, funds of that nature. We have funds that are set up for waterways. Um, we have funds that are set up as receipts for appropriation for the cable fund, PEG access, things of that nature. PEG access is public educa education and government. So those are the cable companies that typically enter into like 10-year agreements um, that, um, with a community that offer funding for public education and government. We also have revolving funds, and revolving funds seem to be a hot topic here in Harwich these days. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, revolving funds. They're authorized at town meeting. Town meeting annually approves those. Uh, spending limits on those um, revolving funds. So, last, this is my Bible. <laughs> this is the warrant from last year. There's an article in here. Which, sorry. Uh, I guess I, oh, okay. Article 64. Authorized all of your revolving funds in the town. Let's go to town meeting for approval. And those are in the bylaw of the town of Harwich. <coughs> so the Department of Revenue, um, again, Department of Revenue of the Commonwealth authorizes different types of revolving funds. Um, and they have a, 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 a description here of what they are, um, and these funds, they fluctuate with demand. You can imagine if I have 25 people sign up for pickleball this year, but I have 125 people sign up next year, I'm not going to have the appropriation to be able to afford to pay the expenses for that if it was in the operating budget. Because I couldn't anticipate that it was going to be 125 people. Um, that goes back to you can't spend more than what was authorized at town meeting. So you also want, with revolving funds, I, what I cannot do is say, well, I'm going to offer a program at the library for um, a cooking class and I'm going to take the money, the expenses that's associated with that, out of cemetery lot sales. Well, I can't do that. The, 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 the revenue that you generate and the expenses that you incur must match. <clears throat> so the types of revolving funds that the town has are called departmental revolving funds. There's probably about 20 different types of revolving funds that are authorized by the Commonwealth. These, the ones that the town of Harwich has, are all authorized under uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53, E and a half. <laughs> um, um, so, again, they're voted on annually. You'll vote if you come to in May to town meeting. You'll see them on the warrant. Um, they have spending limits that cannot be exceeded. Last night, the, the, the general law pro prohibits exceeding a um, spending limit on a revolving fund. However, there's a remedy. If you know you're going to go over, you go to the Board of Selectmen and you ask them to increase that spending limit. That spending limit is only increased for that year meaning you still got to go back to town meeting for the next year. Um, and the Board of Selectmen did that last night. 
They increased uh, the revolving fund expenditures for the maximum spending limit for the recreation department. Um, you can use them for any types of expenses. Um, if, um, if you locally, if you allow salaries to be expended from them, you can use them for salaries. Harwich uses them for salaries, some of them. You can use them for any other types of expenses that are associated with the programs and the activities um, of that revolving fund. You can also use them for debt. So you can pay capital expenses and you can pay debt expenses um, uh, from those um, revolving funds. In fact, when Cranberry Valley finishes its $1.2 million project, it's getting close. Um, <laughs> we're going to go out to the market, we're going to sell those bonds, and um, the golf department has two revolving funds. One of them is one of the supports capital <coughs> debt, and that is the fund that will be paying for the debt service on the $1.2 million improvement. And so the town of Harwich currently has 12 revolving funds. It's a lot. Okay. Um, does anybody need like a break from me to stop talking and you talk? <laughs> okay. I have a question. Sure. Your pickleball example. Oh. Yes. Let's suppose that the it, it, the budget is set up. In the pickleball example. Let's suppose the budget is set up for 50 players, and it's three thousand dollars. And then you have a hundred people who want to play pickleball. Can you explain further how you, what you do if only three thousand dollars has been budgeted for that? Okay. So, so in this example, um, is it the recreation's <coughs> operating budget, or is it the recreation's revolving fund? That's key. If it's the do you want me to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Please. if it's the recreation's operating budget, then, and, and let's say the expenses came in at $6,000, right. okay? Then they have to take $3,000 from something else that they cannot spend and, and use it for pickleball. So they might move money from the bocce budget to the pickleball budget or... Oh, yes. Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay. Essentially, yes. So within some fund, they right. can move money around, but well, only... The general fund, <coughs> right? <coughs> Which is the operating budget. Okay. okay, different scenario. Pickleball is part of the revolving fund. So the rec director and the recreation commission are responsible for those funds. They're responsible for the programs in those funds. So what happens? What happens when they plan on 50 people playing pickleball? So each person that plays pickleball pays I always multiply $25. <laughs> $25, let's say. Um, and the expenses associated with that for the person that's there, helping them play pickleball, teaching them how to play, for the balls, whatever equipment that they need. Um, so let's say they. 100 people show up. This is really popular, and it is popular here, right? Um, 100 people show up, and they take this 100 people money, as long as they have room in the building, and they're not exceeding occupancy standards, right? They'll take all 100 people, or the $25, and they have to purchase supplies to support those, and then they say, <coughs> oh no, there's too many people. I'm going to exceed my maximum spending limit. I have to go to the board of selectmen and ask them to increase it. Or, well, <coughs> not as many people showed up to play t-ball, so one upsets the other. I'm not my maximum spending level of hundred thousand dollars. I'm not going to go over that, so I'm okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, as relates to the issuance of debt. Um, you were making a reference to the uh, golf course. Um, and when that debt is issued, uh, how do the rating agencies, how do the rating agencies look 
at the revenue source? Do they look at the revolving fund, or do they look at the town of Howish overall? Um, well, we're, we're going to we have a whole session oh. on that, but okay. um, but they're going. This is a general obligation of the town of Howish. Okay, so it's not. So if the it's golf course closed tomorrow. Okay. Guess what? Okay, it's not relying on that revolving. It's not. Okay. So you have an overall budget for the town, okay? And let's say, and I'm going to use one of the things I might be familiar with. Let's just say what they've allowed for what's happening with wastewater, with, with the, um, uh, the sewering, all right? Let's say he goes above that this year and it hasn't been accounted for. What happens? Does that, they talk about free cash. Does, what's free? Uh -huh. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Again, you cannot exceed your appropriation. All right. So then you, you just have to hold the project temporarily for the year? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay. a special town meeting if you have to. Oh, the right. voters need to decide. Okay. It's not at the purview of the town administration. Okay. Not at all. All right. Okay, thank you. Right. Oh, one more. We'll do one more. <laughs> No more? I do. I have one. Okay, go ahead. I'm here too. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, my question's about revolving funds. You said uh, you could pay salaries out of them. Is that only part time, or is that also full time? And what about benefits? So, so revolving funds. So they're locally accepted, right? They're authorized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So Commonwealth says, you towns and cities, you can have a revolving. And look at all the different 20 ones you can have, right? So figure out which one you want, what you want it to look like, what's the, 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 the uh, activities and the expenses that are going to be associated with that. Okay. So, um, so once those are authorized, um, you can expend particular things for it. The state will allow you to expend salaries. The state will allow you, if it's a full time, you must account for the benefits in the revolving fund. Locally, the town allows for part-time salaries. No benefits. What is the funding source for the funding activity? Is it all based on taxes? No, it's no, none of it's paid in taxes. So revolving funds, is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. What is the yeah. source of revenue for the fund? What the source of revenue, that's a really good question. The source of revenue for the fund are user fees, what we call user fees. So if I want to play pickleball, I have to pay for it. Oh, I see. So is the sole funding of revolving funds user fees? Pretty much. Um, okay. You know, so um, the community center has a weight room revolving fund, right? And the receipts from the from the membership of the weight room go into that fund, and the fund uses expenses to part pay part time salaries. It uses, you know, for um, they have like instructors in there, um, and to replace equipment or to repair equipment or maintain the equipment. Um, so, so that's a source. That's the source of revenue for that one. Okay. So no tax revenue. No. Just creates a revolving. It's no. Used to create a revolving fund. No. Okay. Can I ask one quick question? Is the enterprise fund the same? It's water receipts. So the water enterprise fund is from water receipts. It, it is the from funding water source. Receipts. So there'll be different sources of revenue, um, and you know, so water rates go out. They, you know, when they they bill quarterly now, um, and so you're paying based on your usage. You're also going to pay if you want to have your water shut off for a period of time. You're going away for a few months. You're going to pay for that. The the fund. Um, 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 earns interest, so that's another source of revenue for the fund. But yes, it's all surrounding water. Well, are you going to be discussing CPC funds? If we have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it's just a different. So the budget. Yeah. So the budget process is the most important process that any municipality, school district undertakes, state government, federal government. Okay, so. 
So there are certain steps or certain stages to that budget process. They occur annually, so it's just like a revolving door, but planning is the most important stage. Um, then we have guidelines. The Board of Selectmen meet in the public <coughs> session. They set guidelines for the town administrator, and they set the stage for how they would like the budget to be prepared. The town administrator then uh, issues uh, department heads uh, those, some guidelines of his or hers, um, and typically they follow the board of selectmen. Um, and then department heads are charged with preparing their budgets. They prepare salaries and, and wages. They prepare all of their expenses. They submit those into the town administrator. Um, there's meetings that occur directly with the town administrator, finance director, department head. Um, they meet with every department head. Uh, we review all of the expenses in detail. Town administrator then makes any changes he needs for the budget. Maybe there's an error. Maybe there's a miscalculation. Maybe there's something that was left out, in a, you know, inadvertent. Um, maybe there's just reductions that need to be made. Town administrator then prepares that budget, presents it to the board of selectmen, and then we'll go on from there. Um, but so the, that's the review process. Um, then finally, we get to town meeting, right? The finance committee gets to town meeting, and board of selectmen and budget presented at town meeting. Um, and then what do we do? We adopt the budget in the finance office, and then we monitor it all year long. So the budget timeline is one of the most important um, documents because it sets the stage of what's going to happen over the next six or eight months. Um, I have a copy of the one here for you. It's over here on the table. This is the current um, year timeline. Um, we begin with the end in mind. So we take that last date um, that, that things have to be submitted to town meeting on town meeting floor, and we back up that timeline to August. So May to August. We start the budget process in August of every year. We include, we share this document with everyone, every committee, every uh, department, um, and then it's a continuous process because as soon as that's done, we drop the budget, guess what? We're starting a new timeline. Those, the timeline um, is, has, has um, state restrictions, so you will do this by this day, so, or it has locally imposed, the town administrator would like all the department heads budget in by November 27th. So the town administrator is required by, by um, locally imposed regulations to submit his budget document to the board of selectmen by, uh, on or before the second Tuesday in February. Um, because that provides the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee enough time to review those budgets in detail. Again, it's the most important process we do here. Um, and it, it, you know, the town administrator issues a document to the Board of Selectmen. This year, if I'm not mistaken, I think we, I put together a 250-page document. Um, and it talks about there's a lot of narrative in that. There's some numbers in that. There's some charts in that. But, but the narrative, the budget message from the town administrator talks about service levels. It talks about goals and objectives for the budget. You're entrusting um, ta really important taxpayer dollars with uh, a town administration that, that, um, that recognizes the importance of um, the, the process and the budget process here is forward thinking as well. So early on, we prepare a five-year fiscal forecast. That fiscal forecast is, um, projects out for the next, as I said, five years, what the expenses and the revenue are going to be for the town. So it's strategic and it's forward thinking. So. Um, the two most important financial documents that are issued by the town of Harwich are the budget document and what we call a CAFR. 
a comprehensive annual financial report. Those are the two most important documents. Um, they, they, the town, and again, um, if this is up on a website, you'll be able to, if this document, uh, PowerPoint is up on the website, mm -hmm. I've linked these, um, these two, the actual documents that are on the town of Harwich's uh, website. So you'll be able to, to double click on FY20 proposed budget and it'll bring you right to that budget document. Can I ask a question? Does that budget include warrants? Does it include articles? Warrants. 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 Yeah. Warrants. 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 Warrants.
Those are all in what we call general government. And then you'll have parks and recreation, and you'll have golf and harbor and all of those other departments as well. Okay, so you want to talk about taxes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what's Proposition 2 and a half? So um, in November, November 1980, taxpayers in Massachusetts said, yes, we want Proposition 2 and a half. Well, what does that mean? That means that the state imposes restrictions on your property tax levy. How much you can levy. Um, so a restriction on a tax levy um, says you can only increase 2.5%. That's, the t that's the, what we, they call the levy ceiling. Okay? But you can increase a little bit more because you, we'll give you credit for the fact that there's a new house built in Harwich, right? That are going to be on your tax rolls now. We'll give you credit for all of that. Or someone went to the building department, they want to make renovations to their home, and so they pull the building permit, they finish the project, the assessor goes out and looks at the property, they say, yes, it's, it's, it's now valued here, it's more. That goes on the tax rolls. So they give you credit for that. So the only thing you're going to get credit for is 2.5% over the prior year, and then some what we call new growth. What else does Proposition 2.5 give you? It gives you the ability to raise it even higher, right? Some of those are permanent, <coughs> some of them are temporary. So you can have an override, what we call a budget override, or a general override. It allows you to expend money for any purpose. It's permanent. Oh, so the last yeah. time the town of Harwich had an override was in 2012 for the school district. I believe the time before that, if my memory is correct, is 2009, maybe for firefighters. So those are permanent increases. Those will always become part of your tax ceiling. Right. So, what's, so what's temporary? There's two different types of temporary um, increases. One is um, uh, a debt exclusion, and one is a capital exclusion. So what's a debt exclusion? Well, I come to you. I say, I want to build a new fire station. I want to replace the one that I have, and I want to build a new one. But I don't have room in my levy limit. Right? I ran out of room. But I really, really need this fire station. So you go through the process. You go to town meeting. You ask at town meeting, will you support this? But you say, maybe you say yes. It goes to the ballot. It must go to the ballot. So it goes to the ballot, let's say they support it. So the town says, OK, we're going to build a new fire station. When that fire station is done, we're going to convert my office. It's going to convert that to long-term <coughs> debt. And let's say, I'm making this up, OK? So don't quote me. Let's say we say the life of that fire station is 20 years. So for 20 years, your levy has increased. <coughs> It's temporary, but as soon as that's paid off, guess what? You're done. So let's say, and I'm not picking on fire department, but we might as well, right? It's easy. They're an easy target, right? So let's say I say, oh, you know, I really need a new pumper, and I want to pay for it in one year, right? I just want to pay for it. So you go to town meeting and you say, I want to buy this capital item, and I want to pay for it in one year, and I really need it. Okay, they say yes. Go in the ballot question, they say yes too. Temporary, one year. So does that mean, hypothetically in that example, the taxes would go up a little bit for that year to pay for that pumper, but they would in theory come down the next year yep. because the pumper is all paid for it. Yeah, I'm not good with <coughs> then there's gonna be something else. Yeah, I'm not good with, I'm not good with pointers. Okay, so, so this is actual for the town of Harwich. I'm giving you an example. 
So this is what actually happened in FY18. There's the budget for FY19, and here's an early, early proposal. Okay, it's, it's, this is going to change a little bit. Um, so you see this $420,000? Mm -hmm. That was a one-year capital exclusion that was voted here. Um, the, what you see the line right under that? Well, so let's start at the beginning. So if you look at, a good example is to look at either 19 or 20. You can see that the beginning number, 42,683,458 in the middle column, is coming directly from the actual of FY18. You see that? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we start. We calculate 2.5%. Right. Okay. We look at new growth. We come, we come down to um, uh, a subtotal here. And then the next two line items, if the $3.3 .3 million and the 1.6, you follow me, mm -hmm. um, are items that have gone to a town meeting. They've gone on the ballot. They were approved for a temporary um, exclusion. So excluding it from the debt levy, from the ceiling, I'm sorry, the limit. So they're excluded. So they say, you don't count these in when you when you um, prepare your limit of how much you're raising taxes. Temporarily. So you can see that here. There's school. This is the high school. The new high school um, was voted as a debt exclusion. One more regional high school. Right. So Well, how could it, but that would have gone up for a number of years? It does go up for a number of years. Think of the length of the high school. Yeah. Right? Oops. Yeah. So that debt goes out for a number of years. Wow. It's amortized over, you know, the life of the building. Okay. So then you come down to, um, to what your levy increase can, can be for the year, and that's it. No more. So you go to town meeting and you ask the question, please, I really need that by a bumper, right? Well, and then it goes on the ballot and just the ballot question, will you approve this? Unless it's approved, but those two, um, I guess, um, sessions, you're, you're not going to get your fire bumper. Just, a, just a, a quick question. I mean, there's capital purchases, right? But the, there's a difference between a capital purchase and a capital exclusion, right? Oh yeah, right, because so, I can buy, right. we buy capital all the time, right? We, we say um, there's articles that, that go, that are in the warrant that say, you know, DPW department needs a new right. dump truck. Um, and will you approve that new dump truck? So if we purchase capital, we have to, right? Otherwise we, would, we wouldn't be able to provide the services that the town expects. Um, Author, we authorize um, overlay or what, people file for abatements. They maybe have exemptions, a veteran's exemption. We budget for that on an annual basis. We budget $460,000 for that mm -hmm. cost. So now we're going to go through the process of how do you set the tax, how do you set the tax rate. Um, so we projected the levy. We figured out whether we're going to have any debt exclusions or capital exclusions, or are we going to have an override? Um, we estimated, finance department has estimated the total revenues for the upcoming year. Um, we adopted and we implemented the budget. The assessor, the board of assessors, determines what the assessed valuations are of the community. <laughs> the board of selectmen are required by law to hold a public meeting. And then we prepare the tax rate. The finance director and the assessor prepare the tax rate, approved by the board of assessors, approved by the board of selectmen, goes to the state, is approved by the Department of Revenue. Um, we, we obviously assess, and you all get a tax bill, right, that you pay. Um, and then we administer abatements uh, or exemptions. It's a cycle that continues on an annual basis. Okay, so you want to talk about debt, right? Um, 
When we, we issue debt for many different reasons, it could be wastewater, it could be a new fire department, it could be Cranberry Valley's um, capital project. Um, we, you can also um, um, issue debt for major equipment expenses, infrastructure improvements, uh, roadway improvements, and things of that nature. So it's, it's just like you borrowing money for um, the item you would like to purchase a home, let's say. Um, we, but we sell bonds. Uh, we sell municipal bonds. Um, so, so we're the borrower. Um, we, we go out in the market. We have a process. Finance director, the treasurer collector, work directly with a financial advisor. We use Hilltop Securities in Harwich. Um, we also work directly with Bond Council. Um, so that's a legal firm that specifically um, is, um, specializes in municipal bonds. Um, so that's Lock Lord. That's who we use here. Um, so there's a process. Um, the bonds are sold on the market. We pay back those bonds over a course of years. Depends on the asset life. So if, if it's a truck, it's going to be a lot less than if it's a building. Right? The building's going to last a lot longer. We can never take out that debt longer than the useful life of the equipment or capital expenditure. So let's say I bought, I built a fire station. Let's say I decided that that fire station was going to be, um, with the, the useful life of that fire station is 25 years. Um, so I cannot exceed I can't take my bond out. I can't say, I'll pay you back in 30 years. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to. I have to say, I'll pay you back in 25 years. So Harwich um, goes through a process where um, um, the, the credit rating for the town is um, analyzed. We use standard and Poor's. Um, since I've been here, we've gone through that process two times. Um, and it's typically when you're issuing large sums of debt. Um, we, we went out to the bond market in May, in May sold bonds in June, um, uh, $12 million worth of bonds in June, um, and we had a rating call. That's what they call it. They call it a rating call. Um, you can use different um, organizations. We use Standard & Poor's. Smoothies is out there. There's other organizations out there. Um, but so. So these are general obligation bonds. They're funded. They're, they're backed by the town of Harwich. Um, and the long-term rating that we received was a double A plus. The short-term rating, which is the highest rating that, um, that Standard & Poor's gives, is an SP1 plus, which the town of Harwich received. So I know this is probably too much information, but if you want to know about different ratings that um, Standard and Poor's um, considers um, for each um, organization in which they rate. There's different um, categories. There's a triple A, there's double A. We're right in the middle. We're in the middle between a double A and a triple A, so double A plus. Um, and then the lowest one is a credit rating of a C. And so you probably don't want me to read all that to so these are the factors that Standard & Poor's use to evaluate. Did you have a question? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, do you know uh, how much of the debt ends up in the hands of institutional investors or retail investors? See, I don't know that. Okay. I may be able to find that out for you. I mean, is it generally bought by the local banks or is no. it, or, or the well, money funds well, or, you know, who, who, yeah. who do you find are the, you know, because one of the things you like to try to do is get as much of it into retail hands as possible because you'll pay a lower interest rate. So that's a, an interesting, you know, I can direction show you, that you I can show you everybody that bid on them um, the past couple oh, of Oh, so you're doing competitive bidding? Oh, yes, we are. You're not negotiating? Financial, financial advisors as a competitive bidding. Okay, so no, no negotiated debt? No. Okay. Um, these are the, all of the um, different categories that um, Standard & Poor's uses to rate um, any municipality. This is what, um, so th these all add up to 100. Um, Town of Harwich got a little less than 100, right? Um, just a little bit less because we're a double A plus and not a triple A, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
But these are this this is how they categorized the town of Highwich. So they, they thought the economy was really strong, um, that they had strong management and administration, um, and so on and so forth. They looked at the ability of the town to repay that debt, and that's another factor. They looked at the ability of the town to pay its obligations. So some of the obligations of the town of Harwich and every other municipality are what we call OPEP, other post-employment benefits. Other post-employment benefits are things such as health insurance that you're going to pay in the future for your retired employees, right? The town funds um, OPEB, their OPEB liability, uh, or their obligation on an annual basis. Um, some municipalities have it fully funded. Others do not. So the town of High Ridge is not fully funded. Um, so that's one of the negative um, items that, um, that Standard and Poor's <coughs> assessed the town. What's the funding level? <coughs> Pardon me? What's the funding level that we? What, $40 million. OK, which is a, what, what is our exposure? What's the percentage of exposure? Um, I, I, if I recall correctly, the OPEP balance is just a little over a million dollars. Okay. It's in a trust fund. Okay. So here's another chart. Um, so we, we have three different categories of debt. Um, so we have stuff that we've already got out to the market. We sold the bonds. We're paying on the debt, right? We annually, we pay principal and interest. Um, then we have ones that the town has, has generously um, authorized, so such as fire station. We haven't gone to the market yet and sold those bonds. When that project's complete, we'll go to the market, we'll sell those bonds. Um, and then, so that's what we call authorized and unissued. So we have existing debt, which is the purple. Today is National Purple Day. <laughs> um, the, the dark green is what's already been authorized but hasn't been issued yet. Um, we do issue debt on a short-term basis, so we, we, to build that fire station, we got to have $4 million, right? Or close to that. So we do borrow money on a short-term basis. Um, and then there's ones that we're going to come and ask you for. We're going to come to you and say, I really want to do Lower County Road. Will you please approve it? Okay, so that thing, um, and, or we have big waste water, you know, projects coming forward. So, we please approve it. Um, so, uh, so all this chart is trying to show you is what we know today, what we know today, what's in that capital plan. Um, that capital plan is a six-year plan, so we can project forward six years. I'm saying it's not going to change. This is just an estimation. So, based on the debt you have now. Um, the left-hand column shows you what's it going to raise in the median um, taxpayer. What's going to raise your taxes? What? And then on the right-hand side, it says, what's estimated tax rate impact? So if your taxes are eight dollars and fifty cents right now, right per thousand, it's going to raise it. Let's say a dollar forty. So it'll be follow me. Thirty-nine dollars. Sure. I've been here nine years and I still miss out those three trucks that came every Wednesday and collected the trash, the newspapers, and the bottles where I used to live. Why in New England do does everybody take everything to the dump? Do people not want to? I'm in New England. I've been in lots of places in New England. Okay, so, so why does is it voters car which don't want to fund? Trash collection. Yeah. I think everybody likes going to trash collection. <laughs> 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 you can hire a private. There's a lot of work that can be done at the trash collection. You can hire a private if you want, but you right. pay for it. And it's stunningly expensive, but if it's in your taxes, which were much higher where I came from, you <coughs> don't think about it. Are they working on a AAA bond Yes, they are. Is so this is it impossible? Or well, so I can tell you. Planning? So I can tell you this year. Um, the, the federal government had a retiree drug subsidy program where they're giving back money to municipalities for monies that have been spent um, and for retirees and their 
um, supplemental plans, right, that the town pays a portion of. And so they, 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 in other states, they did it on an annual basis, but here, I guess they waited. So 2010 to 2014, um, this money was, um, the federal government decided that they were going to pull together and get back all this money. So Commonwealth of Massachusetts has said, okay, you're going to release it now, and so Town of Harvard is going to get $521,000. So town meeting, we're going to say, will you please let us put that in the OPEB fund. In addition to that, we, we on the town on an annual basis, depending on what their free cash balance is, one of the priorities is to fund that OPEB. So you'll see maybe a $500,000 is being asked at town meeting to fund OPEB. In addition to that, the town annually budgets some funds, not a lot, but some funds, to fund their portion of OPEP. What I believe what's in this year is $125,000, plus $50,000 from the water department. Because they have their own um, liability as well. I can't tell you what that is off the top of my head, because I don't remember the number. Do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to make the comment that I think we would like to have our trash all picked up, except <laughs> over the course of the year, there isn't anybody here. So that would mean the trucks and the employees we would have to fund. We'd yeah. have to fund them all year round so we could cover two months of the year. So I mean, that's, that's the other side of some of the service issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered about the seasonality. So you have a killer finance department, right? Yeah. You do. Yes. Yeah. You so <laughs> it's, you've got a great treasurer collector. She's got great staff oh, under her. Um, we have an assessing department great staff under uh, that director, and then we have um, my um, immediate department, and I've got a couple of people in my department that process a lot of the transactions that happen in the town of Harwich. Um, the departments also do, we're, we're um, decentralized, what we call, um, so what, what instead, of, instead of all of the invoices for the entire town coming to the finance office, we say, DPW, guess what, you get your and parks and you get your pile. And so they process it, send it all into, um, all the, dir the directors have to review every invoice. Those invoices are signed off on. We have an authority to pay those. They, they enter them in our accounting system. Um, town is a fantastic accounting system. It's just um, the best, I believe, out there for municipal government. Yep. Um, and, um, and then they come to the finance department finance department audits those invoices or payroll records and then process that, processes that information. Finance department is responsible to um, reconcile accounts, go through and make sure um, all of the transactions are properly recorded. Monthly financial statements, revenue and expenses go out to every department head. They go out to committees and commissions. They're required to certify that they're correct in writing and send that information back to us in the finance office. Um, and then what happens? Um, we, we always want to ask, where'd you get the money? Where'd you spend the money on? So what's left over, right? It's not our, it's, we don't call it a bottom line. We call it a fund balance, right? So each fund takes in revenue, has expenses, and they have, at the end, what's left. Um, on, on an annual basis, since I've been here, we started, the town prepares a comprehensive annual financial report, um, those that's on our website. Um, it's the financial doc that's the second most important financial document that the town prepares. Um, it has statistical information, it has introductory information and narrative, it has lots and lots of numbers. Um, <laughs> um, this is audited by the town's auditor. Um, uh, we're required to keep our books on a gap basis, generally accepted accounting principles. Businesses are too. Um, but we report, uh, or we receive our direction from the board in Connecticut. It's called GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And Again, if you ever want to borrow this book, <laughs> I'll lend it out. I have lent it out before. What's the audit process here? So uh, every, about every five years, when I first got here, it was the first thing I did was prepare the RFP for the auditor. Um, so 
Um, we send that out, we receive replies, we review all of the replies, we bring our recommendation to the Board of Selectmen because it's the Board of Selectmen's audit. It's not the town, it's the Board of Selectmen. Um, they either approve or disapprove of our recommendation and then what happens? So April 8th, the auditors are coming to the finance department, which is the town hall, and they're going to test transactions. They're going to do their preliminary work. Um, and then August 26th, um, they'll be there to finalize all their, what we call field work, what they do here in the town of Harwich. They look at all of our internal controls. We pick a couple of departments for them to take a really intense look at, to um, interview folks at those departments, to look really closely at their accounting transactions and to their policies and procedures to make sure that they're following them. Um, they look at Board of Selectmen's minutes. They look at the overall policies and procedures of the town. They want to make sure that when they test those transactions, we're following them. We're following them. We're keeping our records in accordance with government, with um, accounting principles um, that, that the state tells us to do and Gatsby tells us to, to maintain our records that way. Um, the whole process of us preparing for them to be on site takes about 60 days. Um, process, and I mean internal process. The treasurer collector's involved, the assessor's involved, I, of course, am involved. We involve other departments as well, like such as Harbor Master. What did you send out for bills that you haven't received payment yet? Police Department. What special details have you done in June that you sent bills out that you, we didn't get payment on yet? We need to know all of that information. <coughs> so, free cash. You want to talk about free cash? So what's left? Um, what's, we, we have revenues that come in, um, and let's say they're greater than what we anticipated them to be when we set the tax rate. Um, we have expenses that we have appropriations for that came in less than what we intended that, or thought they would come in, um, or we could have one or the other, or both. Um, and, and so that's, a, that's what we call, that's our free cash. It's, we have un, it's unrestricted. Um, we, we are not, we don't, aren't held on holding it for any kind of an open contract, which we would have under what we call an encumbrance or a promise to pay. We don't have any of that. It's all been taken into account when we calculate free cash. So <coughs> on an annual basis, it has to be certified by the Department of Revenue. That typically happens sometime around <coughs> September. Um, I know here, for me, um, since I've been here, um, I usually make sure that my auditors have done my field work, <laughs> make sure we didn't have any mistakes, and then, you know, we, we let the Department of Revenue um, come in and certify our free cash. So they take a review of our financial records, um, so it's a second look um, to certify that. So what can you use it for? You can use it for anything. Anything you want. Unless the Board of Selectmen has a policy that says, oh no. Board of Selectmen here have a policy that says, oh no. They say, capital, one-time expenses. You're not going to hire a new firefighter for free cash. I'm sorry, you're just not going to do it. Because why? It's not a one-time expense. You really want to look at it as a one-time you know, source of funding. Who makes the determination? You do. So um, it's, it's in the warrant. So let's say the Department of Public Works and wants to buy that dump truck and they want to use free cash to pay for it. It goes before the voters. It goes before a town meeting for approval. So it's one of the separate articles that are in this book that are not that are not part of the operating budget. But that goes through a review process too, because that's part of the capital plan. A dump truck is part of that six year capital. So the capital plan gets approved at town meeting, but the funding doesn't get approved. You have to ask for it separately. Okay, so how can I help you? Can I just make a couple of announcements? The first one is to thank Carol. Wasn't this fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> we will take a few 
more question and answers. Um, well, we'll take questions. Carol will answer. Um, I just want to give you a, a date that, because uh, I want you to vote at town meeting and at the election. So if you haven't registered yet, you uh, get a chance to on April 16th. That's your last date. So I'll take the microphone around. How's that? Okay. All right. Question. Yep. I'll read your hat for it. That's nice of you. <laughs> right to your mouth. My name is Jerry Baldwin. I'm okay. chair, chair of the Traffic Safety Committee. We have some different intersections in town that we asked the voters to bring before us that are problematic. There was one at Chatham Road and Route 39. So we talked with Chris Clark and the DPW director, Lake Cooper. Lake went out and got some rough ballpark figures of $100,000 to do what we wanted to do down there. That was thrown into the budget mix. It went for the selectmen, and then the number was not put in the capital plan. That's our omission. We didn't even think about doing that. So they looked at it. They were selecting articles for the annual town meeting. It got squashed, got flushed. So now we want to know how we can take the committee and put money aside or get money put aside for articles that we want to go to the town warrant that would have some stability to it, that it wasn't going to be flushed with the selectmen or the select or the finance committee that's going to make it to the to the actual yeah. warrant. To the warrant to the town meeting. Yeah. Now, I, I understand that Lake gets money from Chapter 90, which is state funds that pay the <coughs> town for a mile's road, and then he gets control of that with the selectmen to pretty much give it to him, and he has a budget after that. There's, can we take some of that Chapter 90 money, or would we have to go to uh, free cash or raise and appropriate. How, how is the best way for us to get some of this stuff done? Okay, so that's a very good question. <laughs> that project came about at the last minute. So you know it wasn't part of the capital plan, right? Yes. I, I, I probably can't speak to you. Uh, I, I can't give, my opinion may be different than other people. Because if you would just ask for my opinion, that's all I can give you right now. I'm looking for an answer no how to put it in the right way. It has to go in the capital plan. So we that's the to, right way to do it. So we have to take heat. Um, in one of your handouts here, it says that to get bid supplements. Now, he put together a guesstimate. Yeah. And they're asking for bid supplements. So. You're, you're asking for the process, right? Yeah. To get uh, in on the you, capital plan? Do we use his bid Maybe that's process? Or do we have to turn around and go out and get our own bid process to find out how to do it? There's I would use the DPW director's process. I okay. would use I, I, I would follow his direction because the Board of Selectmen um, really um, they what's happened here is prices have escalated. So they'll they'll come up with an estimate estimation for a project <coughs> and then by the time the project rolls on and it gets approved, the, the costs have like mm -hmm. skyrocketed. Well, remember, town meeting authorizes a certain dollar amount, and you cannot exceed it. So they, the Board of Selectmen always found themselves having to reappropriate money for projects where they wanted bids. They wanted bids before town meeting. Mm -hmm. So it has to go in the capital plan, has to be part of that process. There has to be a funding source, whatever it is. But it, 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 the, the problem, I think, with that $100,000, it didn't have a funding source. So the $100,000 needs to go, what is the break-even point that things don't go to the capital funding plan versus, is it a, a, there's a number, I understand, is it 50, $100,000? I, I, I think by, by charter or bylaw, it's $50,000. Any other questions? Great. Dan, I'll start with you. How are you? Good. Uh, Dan Clark. Uh, a couple of your budget slides mention departments having goals and objectives. Where are they spelled out, and how does the town measure whether they're being achieved? Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't believe that's a formal process here. I don't believe that you know, every department has a mission statement, and a, you know, particular goal. I mean, I know they have goals and objectives on an annual basis. 
I have goals and objectives for my department on an annual basis. Do I have them in a document that I can send to you? No, I don't. But annually, department heads have go through a process of um, being reviewed. And annually, we have to set goals for our department. And so those goals are evaluated annually by the town administrator or the board of selectmen. I work for the board of selectmen. So the, the, those are um, reviewed and um, determined whether, you know, did you meet your goals? Did you fall short of them? Did you do nothing? We're going to set new goals. So that's what I can tell you. But that's part of the personnel process. Second question. Uh, I came from New York, so we don't have anything like free cash. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, we didn't in New Hampshire. And I'm just curious how, what are the basic accounting principles? Is matching current revenues with current expenditures? How does that reconcile with free cash since it, since it represents revenue from a prior year? So, so, um, so I think of free cash as I think of undesignated fund balance, and you probably know what I'm talking yes. about, right? There's different levels. See, uh, there's different types of fund balance. Some are some. So we have revenue, we have expenses, and then at the end of the day, what's left over is fund balance. Okay, some of that fund balance can be restricted. Yeah. It can be restricted by laws. It can be locally restricted, or it can be unrestricted, right? So the calculation for free cash in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is different than everywhere else I've been, and in all the different states I've been to, um, is you take what's left over, right? You take what's owed to us, right? What do we have remaining that's owed to the harbor master, because I didn't pay my bill by June 30th, but, but guess what? I should have paid it before June 30th because it became due, right? And then, um, so, so they take that first number of what's left, right? At the end of the day, what's left, they subtract out any obligations that are owed to the town. Um, they'll subtract out if you have budget deficits, so if you have funds that are in a deficit situation, well, guess what? We're going we're gonna to reserve that because you've got to fix this situation, right? And then they'll come up with an ending number. Um, so it's really undesignated fund balance. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to understand more clearly the different the differences in the roles and powers of the finance committee, the select board, and the town meeting in, in the budget, and the town administrator, I guess, mm -hmm. in, in that. Who, who what, what do each of them do in the process, and what is their power to restrict the budget, raise the budget? Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm... Sure, sure, that's a great question, and I don't think I touched upon it. So. Um, so the town administrator uh, prepares a budget, presents it to the board of selectmen. Um, the board of selectmen deliberate over that budget. They hold a joint meeting with the finance committee, and I'll talk about how these are all, how they all came about. They hold a joint meeting with the finance committee, and they bring all the departments in on a Saturday, and they say, you know, explain your budget, explain your increases, explain your decreases. You know, what are the new enhanced um, level of services that you're looking for? Um, and what is that going to cost? Um, and so, so, and then the finance committee takes their group of folks, and they sit and deliberate over that budget. They meet with all the, you know, they'll they'll individually have their, have representation with different departments. So they'll come back and report to the entire committee. Well, I met with the Department of Public Works. Um, and this is what I learned from the Department of Public Works. I met with the police chief, and this is what I learned from the police chief. So they deliberate over that budget. They're currently deliberating. There's a meeting tonight if you want to come. It's open to the public, and we're on Thursday. Um, so they're going to talk about that budget, the budget that's been brought forward by the town administrator originally. Um, they are going to, um, so, so annually, so let me back up a little bit. This, document is prepared, it's the warrant, it's got all the articles in it, um, and so the Board of Selectmen ha are required to approve this document they have, well, for the new one. Um, and
And so then um, they 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 have to um, approve or recommend uh, or approve of all the articles within it, not just the document, um, but everything that's contained within the document individually. So the finance committee is then charged with pretty much saying they have to make a recommendation. Do you, do you approve this? Do you need more information? Or do you just say no? Um, so then town meeting happens, the board of selectmen is there, administration is there, administration is only there for support, right? Just to explain things. Um, and the finance committee is there. The finance committee presents the budget, presents the articles. And then town meeting either approves them or not. Board of selectmen, as you're aware, I'm sure, are elected. Um, uh, finance committee are appointed by the moderator. Um, what else? Um, and at the town meeting, is the town meeting allowed to change that budget in any way? Um, as far as I, I see, I'm not an attorney, right? Um, so they can reduce it. Can they increase it? I don't think so, because there's no, unless there's a funding source. If they have, if they find the funding source. If there's a funding source. Right. I'm going to grab this from the Question here? Right? Are you, I, did I stop Thank you? you. Oh, Thank okay. you. Linda? Hi. Um, I was just wondering, the Board of Selectmen at one point, and I don't know if they still do, had a policy that revenues for the budget uh, would be not fully budgeted or anticipated, mm -hmm. but there would be a, uh, you know, say you think you're going to get 50000 in revenues, so you only budget forty five. Mm -hmm. Is that still in existence, and, and pretty much that's kind of what drives free cash? It's a component. But it, but it does drive free They're cash, very conservative right? when we estimate revenues, yeah. and that's by their policy. We're required to be So that policy is still in effect? It is. Thanks. I think that's it. No, one I think no, one, okay. Okay. one more. Maybe that more. Um, just a comment. I worked for quite a few years for a lawyer here in town who was on the finance committee from when they probably found it. And his um, comment about free cash was always was, it ain't free and it ain't cash. <laughs> <laughs> and also I wanted to ask you, uh, new growth. Um, how is that determined each year? Is it a percentage? You no, know, nope, it's the actual percentage growth. percentage of what? Yeah, so uh, good question. So new growth, um, and we're talking about the tax, the, the tax valuations. So, so I built a new house in Harwich. Um, and um, the assessor has to come out and value that home. Um, and that's what we call new growth. Um, I have a building permit that I've taken out and I'm doing major renovations of my home. And um, so the, the, the valuation of those renovations, the assessor comes out, determines those, that what's my new value of my home, and that goes on the tax rolls, and that's all called new growth. Yeah. Yeah. Could you explain? So it's recorded. Oh, yeah, thank you. Could you explain succinctly and simplistically <laughs> the financial context for this pet cemetery issue? We're not going to do local issues now. But I, I, let me, I, I, no, let me I'm not looking for an opinion. No. I just want to know no. what the money aspect is. Okay. I, I can answer the question. Okay, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I can answer the question. So, Thank so um, I, I believe if if this this is all draft right now. Okay, so so that you know that. It's all draft. Um, they're, they're in the capital plan, there was a project to finish the pet burial ground um, and, um, and to be funded with um, uh, the source of revenue is going to be the sale of the lots. Um, so for Fort Town Meeting, to come from the Fort Town Meeting is, uh, in part, is uh, a question on asking for authorization to establish another revolving fund to just handle all the pet burial ground revenue and expenses. So the sale of those lots or, um, would go into that fund. And that fund is the only fund that would be paying expenses. So any kind of capital improvements they want to do, they have to raise the money first before they can spend it. So it would be user funded. That's correct. Okay, thank you. 
This has been wonderful, I think. Have you? Oh, yeah. No, no. I just want to say one thing. Um, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. I'm Jenny Hewitt. I'm the library director. But I also wanted to introduce you to Jennifer Pickett. She's our reference librarian. Yeah. So when you have any questions about um, town government or you're looking for studies or reports or you don't know where to go to ask at town hall, you can ask Jennifer and we, we may have that information. If we don't have it, we can get it. Um, we have, there are um, all the town, annual town reports back to I think 1866 have now been digitized and they're on, they're online, you can get them from anywhere. Um, but we have good resources too if you want to stay current on things. We have, um, with your library card, you can read the Cape Cod Times online just like you would in print. Um, there's another resource that we have that would allow you to get articles from any of the local papers. So if you're researching a subject or history, or a candidate, what they might have said last year, or what was said at town meeting about an article. Um, we can show you how to do that. Uh, so we have a lot of good resources. And there's also this Citizen's Guide to Town Meeting, which is an excellent resource the Secretary of State puts out. It's no longer available in print. It's just a PDF on, on their website. Um, but we have copies here if you want to see it. It explains what a warrant is, how to make motions at town meeting, what the different terms mean, like indefinitely postponed and things like that. So great come see us if you need any info. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to also uh, introduce the committee. Our camera person back there, Emily Milan, also uh, with the library. <laughs> She's on Voter Information Committee. Pam Grosswald here in the front and Peg Rose. And um, with great thanks to Carol Coppola. Coppola, did I get it right? Good, great. So. Uh, uh, you, you brought up one of the articles that we expect to see on our, uh, our town warrant, and on the 22nd of April, uh, our group will be hosting, um, what Peggy will be hosting mostly, uh, what we call the pre-town meeting, and it's a review of the articles on the warrant, not every one of them, not, necessar not the petitioner articles, but the town approved ones, mostly the big money ones, or maybe a there's a planning zoning change. So um, I hope you'll come to that. It's uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. It's not interactive, but it, it's taped, channel 18, and uh, probably then on the YouTube. Um, on the 14th of May, we have a League of Women Voters um, moderator to, to uh, because we have contested Board of Selectmen meeting, uh, contest. Um, and then any of the, uh, there are also seven other uh, vacancies, uh, terms coming up on elected, uh, for elected positions, and we'll interview each of the uh, folks ru running for those, contested or not. Um, am I forgetting something I said I would do? I think you introduced, did you introduce I did, I did. Okay, Carol. This was fabulous. Was so Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.